I heard something. All right. There it is. Hi, everybody. We're here today for another edition of Blogger Hangout on Air. And today I have with me two photo bloggers. Uh, one is David Hobby from Strobist, and the other is Patrick Smith. Um, he also has a photo blog, so we'll let him talk about his blog later as well. Um, the, the topic that we want to talk about today is how it is you can have a photo blog and make it successful and how to build a community around your blog. Um, in order to generate a following, it's really helpful to be able to get a group of people to stay engaged with the content on your blog and to comment on it and discuss it and just make it sort of a lively community. And David has done a great job of that, so we're going to find out more about it from him today. Um, the way that this Hangout on Air will work is that I will be, while David and Patrick are talking and while I ask them questions, I'll be going back and checking um, on the Google Plus page for Blogger to see if you guys have left any questions. And then at the end, we will talk about those questions. Sound good? All right. So David, can you just give us um, just a quick intro into how you started blogging and what you've done with your blog thus far? Okay, so in 2006, um, uh, I, I had a friend, I used to teach community college uh, a photo class locally, and I had a friend who would always ask if uh, I could teach her class, and, and it was really kind of repetitive for me, so the, the, the impetus of the blog was to write down a lot of the stuff that I knew or had learned about lighting over the last 20 years and to put it up on one page to get out of repetitive work as far as going to help uh, my friend teach her class. Um, in, in the getting out of repetitive work since it's been a colossal failure because now it's like repetitive work all the time, but that's cool. Uh, so in, in 2006, it, it, it started out and like immediately it just started spreading, mostly because I think nobody at the time was doing an education slash lighting blog. It was a, it was a new niche and, and it's always good to be first into a niche, but it just spread very quickly, like within... I think the next month it had like 50,000 page views just from zero. So uh, from there it just kind of grew. It, it, it had a, um, uh, an educational core which, which comprised probably the first year of the site and then given that core was already there rather than just going back and repeating that all the time, it's really evolved into an ongoing conversation um, about photography um, kind of centered on lighting but it branches out from there but it always comes, it, that's always the spine of the blog. And with that embedded core, the Lighting 101 and 102 um, there, which people can start at any time. And a, and a couple of thousand people start Lighting 102 or Lighting 101 every day. So what was it that you think really drew your people, drew people to your blog um, in the beginning? And what do you think you did to keep them around? So definitely it was the fact that I was one of the first people being completely open with everything that I had learned over the last 20 years. And, and that's... I think it's a lot more common now. In fact, it is a lot more common now. But in 2006, photographers were more of the mind that you really sequester the information and, and try and um, hide it from your competition and, and such. Um, so, so that idea that someone would be open and just put everything out there and that nothing, nothing held back, was it was uh, re refreshing to a lot of people. And, and word of mouth was just a big, big, big component on, on the blog spreading. And this was before we had social stuff, really, like Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, G Plus and all that kind of thing. Cool. And, and how Patrick, about you? Patrick actually was one of my yeah. first readers. That's how we met. So we go yeah. way back. <laughs> you, were, you were a student at the time, right? I was. Um, Dave was probably one of the first professionals I bumped into, but already knew his work. So when I bumped, I was like, oh, I know your blog. And like he said, there was no real community uh, I guess there was Facebook, but it wasn't as big back then. So it was really cool to kind of be a part of that and hear what other people had to say and be interested in the same things I was. So Awesome. And what do you think, if there is one lesson that you've learned that you think users, you, you mentioned that you know, you, your blog happened at the right time to get all these users. Um, for someone who's starting off now, is there anything that you think would still be applicable? Definitely you want to have a place for your community to coalesce without every thought having to come through you, like comment moderation and things. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 2006, uh, we looked around and, and the best thing that was available at that point was Flickr, so that's where our community grew up. Um, now obviously there are all kinds of choices, 
uh, but but the fact that people could meet together and get on Flickr and discuss things, and they started putting pictures in, and that community really is like pouring gasoline on a fire because when someone would drop a picture into Flickr with all of its users, for instance, that would propagate the site to many people who happen to be interested in the same things. Now, obviously, today with uh, with Google Plus and, and Twitter and, and Facebook, you have lots of different channels for that, but, but you definitely want people to be able to interact without every conversation having to come through you because it scales very poorly um, if you have to do everything in the comments. I mean, you have to have that sense of community, I think, because people will feed on each other much more than you think, and, and the, the better thing, frankly, is that you will get a lot of cool ideas for posts that come upstream from those people as, as, as that conversation starts to happen. It's like a, it's like a vortex. Um, one thing that you're really good at doing is making sure that you're posting consistently. Do you yeah. have any tips about how someone who's creating a blog and finding themselves occasionally like running out of ideas or not really feeling inspired to post on sort of like a... Patrick? A, or, or <laughs> no, sorry? I, I see it like, well, so Patrick's a good example. So you'll post okay. like sporadically sometimes in great spurts and then sometimes not for a while. Um, yeah. Because you're you're primarily a photographer who also blogs, and I'm sort of mm. like a hybrid. So mm. the best advice I would give would be not to set up. You really you're really going to try and post a lot when you first start out because traffic really corresponds with your posting frequency. But mm. don't set up something that you can't maintain. Like don't go in posting five times a day because you're probably not Gawker and and you're not going to be able to maintain that over a long period. Um, so I was all over the map at first, but what I try to tell people is, is, is go for quality over quantity and go for consistency. Whether it's once a day or once a week or once a month, you, you really want to um, be planning far enough ahead to where you can let things bubble around in your head for a while and you're not just writing something on the fly. The longer you think about a post, the more interesting ways that it are going to present themselves for you to approach it before it's actually time to commit it to, to the web. Yeah, I was going to say, for me, it's, I use my blog more or less for motivation to drive myself to, to make those pictures better so I have something to blog about. Um, back then, when I was in college and I shot every day or when I was at a newspaper and I shot three or four assignments a day, I could post three or four times a week, but now some weeks are slow, some weeks I'm not even near the computer to blog. So... It all ranges, but like I said, I like to use my blog as a little bit of inspiration so I know that, oh, no, I don't have anything to post. Mm -hmm. Not that I have a following like David, but at the same time, if I don't have anything to post, it's going to drive me crazy and I'm going to really start looking differently when I'm on assignments rather than just going out and making more normal pictures. Yeah, I think your circumstance is probably more similar to a lot of the people out there who are interested in creating a successful blog. Um, what do you do when you find that you're not gaining, you know, the attention that David's blog is getting? Like, does, do you feel discouraged? Do you feel like, you know, having the blog itself is something that's important enough for you? Or, well, like, the well when, I started, when I started a blog, it was more or less like a visual diary, kind of to look back and say, oh, I shot this or I shot that, or it was a way to kind of, like I said, a visual diary. I could tell, oh, I did this on the assignment. Um, I had a bad time, but I still made it work. Um, those kind of things. Um, but now I, I don't have a following, like I said, anywhere near David, but I do have a decent amount of hits. And uh, I do have normal people that comment and follow, and I try and keep up with it. Um, as of right now, I'm kind of in a funk where it's like I try and post once a week. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, if I get more, I can. But like I said, in the end, it's more or less a visual diary. I still use Blogger as a great way to search. So mm -hmm. if... Um, and I get a lot of people that find my photos that want to license through Blogger, which is nice because of the keywording and everything like that. Um, but if I always look back, I'm like, oh, I shot a Ravens game. I know that photo was somewhere. I can just type it in, and usually I blogged about it. You know what I mean? So it's a nice catalog as well. Cool. Um, I guess my other question for you is when you do blog more frequently, do you find the engagement to go up, um, or is it something that's just kind of like, you know, it's when when you have time? Um, it's obviously the more I post, the more hits I get, the more comments I get, um, and it's, it drops quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. 
we have a, a mutual friend, me and David, I won't say his name, but sometimes he'll post three or four times in a day, and then mm -hmm. he won't blog for like a month, where he, if he spread them out, I think he would get more attention to his blog. So that's what I try and do. If I have a lot of content, I make sure that I, I spread it out. So. Oh, oh, wait, no, 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 you got to name him. Who are you talking about here? <laughs> Matt Rolfe. Oh, Matt. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Matt's a great example of a photo blogger kind of in the same sphere. But, yeah, Matt. Matt's like... Um, he'll, he, purge like it, he'll purge everything. <laughs> right. He's like the manic depressive version of a blogger in terms of frequency. It's like boom, 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 and then nothing. <laughs> Have you guys ever done any sort of offline type events with people that follow your blog? Have you met them, like, you know, just like at a meetup or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Patrick was one of the first people that I met blogging. He was a college student at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, when um, when when I started to produce my, the, I did two DVD series over the years. Um, he was he was involved in that, and, and it was just a very tight community in the Baltimore area. But that was replicated in lots of different places. People were having strobist meetups, which kind of freaked me out the first time I heard it. Um, but that again started propagating the um, blog to people who weren't necessarily. Uh, had, had found it. They just were part of a photo club, and someone would come in and say, "Hey, we're gonna we can do this meetup kind of a thing." So, anytime something like that happens, that's that's good. I think it, it it's just more more vectors for the blog to propagate. Cool. And you, Patrick, have you ever uh, aside from Strobus, do you do any other sort of meetups? Um, I mean, through my blog, I've I've bumped into people at the camera store or something like that. It's like, oh, oh you're really? Wow. Fit. I like your pictures or so and so, and I've actually rented, not rented, but let people borrow my gear or borrow gear from those people, but never to the extent of having a meetup or anything. I've gone to meetups, whether it was David's or someone else's, but never of my own. Okay. That's funny. Uh, actually, talking about borrowing gear for a second, I could, Patrick and I actually did a gear swap. What was it, a couple hmm. years ago, maybe last year? It was last year when I moved back this way, yeah. Yeah, he was thinking about buying a very expensive lens, like, you know, a five-digit lens potentially, I mean, right around there. And, and he had a camera that I was kind of particularly interested in trying out, and I happened to have a similar lens to was one he was considering. So we, we swapped gear uh, for, um, for, I guess, like a week or so, a couple weeks, yeah. as a chance to test drive that. And, and I've never done that before, but, and that was certainly something you could only do if you've got friends online in the community and such, but it was a great idea. And he ended up finding out that the lens that, that he was considering for me wasn't for him, and he went the other way. And I really disliked the camera that I borrowed from him, which was a Fuji X100. But then I ended up, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like the girl that you meet in high school, and you think, eh, and then, and then you end up, like, really discovering her and marrying her, like, a couple years later. And that, that was my case with the, with the X100. So I'm, I'm completely in love with that camera now. But I wouldn't have had a chance at all to test drive. They don't let you test drive photo gear. So having those those online friends and, 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 and local offline contacts can I really think more photographers should do stuff like that. I think we're cool. talking about a business here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, erase, erase all that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll cut it out of the Your, YouTube video. Your com. <laughs> okay, um, David, do you want to talk about a little bit of your um, Hoko 360 blog and? Uh, you know, that's like your more community-driven blog and hear more about it. Right. So, so th that is more of a photo blog than what Strobus does. Strobus is a hybrid education type, everyone hanging out around the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the screen share real quick. The so. water, the water table kind of a thing. But, uh, but, uh, Hoko 360 is, is my version of a hyper-local photo blog. Uh, everything that's on it is, is within Howard County. Um, and, and that is the only real, uh, structure to the blog. It's the Visual Journal of Howard County. Um, I have been doing it for, uh, I guess, a couple years now. And it's, ca it's more like Patrick. It's more catch as catch can. I, I only want to post when I have interesting stuff to post. I don't want to be held to any kind of a schedule. Uh, but I want the pictures and, and the things that uh, we're doing to drive the blog. So that and it, it's much, much more of a typical photo blog and what I think um, a lot of the people that might be listening to this would end up doing than, than what I'm doing with Strobist. Okay, well, speaking of Strobist, let's go there. And can you kind of talk through um, what are some things, tweaks that you've done on the site over the years to, you know, engage your readers more? Um, well, that, that little pack up top, the little link, uh, the, the links like where it says, welcome to Strobist, my local photo blog, those sorts of things. 
Mm -hmm. I've, I've definitely tested those things to see uh, what sends people into different areas of the site. And what you're showing now is the welcome page, which was my first post. Um, and it, it, it says Tuesday, February 28, 2006, but it wasn't. Um, I actually did it in March. I started uh, like manically posting in March, uh, maybe March the 20th or so. And then I got to around the um, beginning of April and I thought, okay, I want to start letting people know about this. So I waited until I posted in April. Um, I, in fact, I went live on April the 5th or April the 6th and I backdated my first post to February and, and that was just so I could look like I had three months worth of content. So I wouldn't be like that that person that puts up a blog post and tells everyone he's got a blog. Um, so so I, I think there are always little tweaks and stuff that you're you're looking to do. And and that welcome page has evolved probably 50 times over the last six years. I'm always updating it because it is the entry point for a lot of people who discover the site because of the welcome to Strobist link up top. And and I, I, I'm always evolving that to show what Strobus is now and then that, that, that dichotomy between the um, ongoing conversation about light and the core educational um, modules that exist uh, within. And, and Strobus is really kind of two sides in one in that regard. Okay. And so your blog is very kind of focused on this one idea of lighting and that's what draws people to it. Um, do you... how? Do you find that most of your audience are interested in that core, um, like, information about that core topic, or are you finding that it's pretty easy to engage people in other topics as well? Does it really kind of like brand you? Um, you know, it, it's funny. I've I've gone through a transition over the last year where it, I mean, the. <laughs> And I mean this in the best way when I say like sometimes you feel like you've created a monster because mm -hmm. b because there are a lot of people who read this site and it's like they just want to know about lighting techniques and they just want to know about gear all the time. And that's neat, but that's a finite amount of information. I mean, you, you can spend a, a year in elementary school learning the alphabet and learning how to write your capital and uppercase letters and all, but when you get to the end of those 26 letters, that's it. There is no more alphabet. It really is about you learning to form words and be a better communicator and use that alphabet as a tool to do interesting things. But there's definitely a group of people that read the site that just want to be like spoon-fed a next lighting lesson. And I think we kind of bump heads over that every now and then because that, that educational content already exists in like really exhaustive form on the site. And and what, uh, what where the site is now is more of, a, of if, it's, if it's more of a broader photography blog with a with a network with a uh, a narrative of lighting. You can always go back to the educational content, but I want to get people past the idea of lighting for lighting's sake and making interesting, meaningful pictures. Uh, otherwise, I think they're missing the whole point of learning how to light rather than just doing parlor tricks or, or literally taking pictures of their GI Joe doll in the basement at night because the cat won't stay in the same room with them anymore. You know, so so. There's always going to be a little bit of a, um, a push and pull between what a blogger would like to do and what an audience would prefer that they do all the time. Cool. Um, do people come to your blog basically asking you to teach them how to become a successful blogger? They leave you comments like, David, come look at my blog and tell me how I can improve it. Yeah. Uh, and I had the um, I had my email address on the blog at first because you want that feedback and and mm -hmm. hey you know how are we doing what would you like to see blah 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 but at one point I realized that I was getting like 500 emails a day and I'm not exaggerating I mean just like they would just pour in and at that point I I, I picked up the computer one day and started nothing but answering email at nine o'clock in the morning and I got to like eleven o'clock at night and I was further behind than when I had started in the morning. And I realized that that wasn't sustainable. So I really have since tried to push that conversation to the Flickr group where people can throw things back and forth. Um, still get a lot of upstreams from Twitter, but that's pretty, um, you know, 140 characters, it's tough to be verbose in that. So you can usually pop those things off pretty quickly. Um, but but it, this one is be careful what you wish for things because it, it works great if your scale is small to modest, but it works horribly if your scale is huge. I mean, I would imagine no one knows that better than you can Google. But if you just, like, had an address where people can email a question, it would just be, <laughs> I don't even think of the scale that would, that would come up. <laughs> the, the notification status for the Blogger Plus page is known to be off the charts. <laughs> oh, jeez. I would imagine. It's great for me to be able to go in and just kind of see... Um, 
like a cross section of all the things that people want to talk about um, relating mm -hmm. to bloggers. So I'm sure that's useful for you still to be able to go in and see like everything that people say, just like a fire hose of information. It, it is. It's great, but it's totally a fire hose. So so mm -hmm. I, I I I did um, create a pressure valve for that, uh, and and it really it, it, what it did was morph into a neat idea for posts. I've got a Q and A series where. I'll, I'll occasionally pull interesting questions that, that just automatically bubble up from the leadership. Or like if I do a post and there's like five or six interesting questions in the comments, you take those questions and reform a second look at that subject about it. And that it's, it's a nice pressure valve for people answering the, asking the questions, but it also is it's new content for the blog. So it's kind of a kind of a win-win. And, and I just let that go catch as catch can. If there's um, if there's good stuff coming up, yeah, let's do one. But it's not like I'm going to do one every two weeks. Cool, um, Patrick. I have a question for you. So, how much do you engage with your users that comment on your blog? Do you respond to them individually? And do you, like do you find that sometimes, you know, that's the the best thing to do, or do you think that it's better to to you know respond to some things, but then leave others and just post about it in general? You know, it's funny. I get more emails than I do comments most of the time. I don't know if people are scared to put comments because I don't get many um, or what, but I usually get a lot of emails. But I'm, I'm very anal about my emails, so I respond quickly and I make sure I get back to them. And um, I was going to rewind a little bit back to the design. I get a lot mm -hmm. of emails, uh, whether they're from friends or others, about my formatting on my blogger. Um, Unlike David, who I think is kind of back to the basics of his blogger, I don't. It's the, still the black on the white, and um, I've changed mine, and I, I continually change it. I make the pictures bigger and all that. Um, so I always get people asking me, "Oh, can you help me? Can you go look at mine? Can you help me code mine?" Mm -hmm. But I was going to ask David this. I mean, how many people do you think read from a an RSS reader like? Um, on Google, or compared to actually going to your site, hitting it live. I mean, do you think more people go to the site, or do they read it off of an RSS? Well, that that was actually a really interesting problem that I had uh, a, a couple of years ago. And I used to put full feeds on RSS. Um, right now, it's got like a, maybe a quarter million RSS subscribers. On the, the like the little badge on the site will will say it on any given day. Um, but what I found was a lot of scraper blogs were scraping the entire content and just literally grabbing it and putting it on their made for AdSense sites and maybe a hundred on any given post would scrape it and put it up and I, I kept trying to fit I mean you can't really you, you can write to Google and say hey can you um, can you take these people off blogger or whatever but it's a it's a fairly involved process to do even just one time so so what I decided to do a couple years ago was to go to partial feeds where you'll get the opening part of the post and then there's you know a few lines, a picture a few lines, and then a break, read more. So that pushes the traffic to Strobist. Um, and the really cool thing was uh, that all those sites that were prior, you know, scraping the entire post, now they scrape, like, the top part of the post, and then the link goes to my site. So, so it, it, it's, not, it's not a great family of quality inbound links, but there is actually meaningful traffic now from people who are formal, formally scraping the blog, and it's all automated. So it's not like they're going to go in and go, hey, I'm not getting to show this full post anymore. i got to take that down. They don't know. They're, they're on to their next site that they're scraping or their next 500 sites. So yeah, it's yeah, a good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Dumb luck. I mean, I really wanted to do what was best for the readers at first and give the whole post out there because a lot of people do use RSS readers, but but it just wasn't. I literally could not stay sane and see a hundred sites scraping every post that I put up. It is just like it's one of those things. It, you, sorry, you know. <laughs> and and on the on the same day, I put I, I also introduced mobile formats. So it was sort of like a, a spoonful of sugar with the medicine, and everything netted out fine. And and everyone said, well, people are still going to grab your content stuff. But literally, I, you know, knock on wood, I I, I haven't I haven't seen any like significant scraping behavior that would involve going in grabbing the post and you know, and transporting that text. It's, it's a lot more uh, work to do than for people just to, to scrape an RSS feed. Cool. Sounds like a good strategy. So I'm think, I think we should move on to some questions from uh, users who commented. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you guys ready for that? Okay, so the first one is from Susie, and she wanted to know about when she should replace a camera. 
She has, let me just read the whole post to you. I would love to learn more. How does one know when replacing a camera will, will work for what one wants to do? I have looked for six months and do not want to spend hundreds, but I want clarity and quality. My six-year-old camera was dropped and is no, no longer viable. Do you guys have any suggestions for Susie? When you drop a camera and it no longer works, that's a great time to replace yeah. the camera, actually. That was, my first thought was, if it doesn't work, it's time to buy a new one. Yeah, do you guys have any suggestions for good cameras that don't cost a ton? Sounds like she wants to get like a solid, reliable camera, but does not want to spend a ton of money. I, I think what, right? I it's always there, right? Always there. So I, I think most professional photographers uh, approach their camera selection and their lens selection in two different channels. I mean, lenses you marry, cameras you date. Um, you, you, you know, spend your money on good glass to put in front of your cameras with the idea that the cameras behind the lenses are just going to get better over time. Um, so I would suggest that she probably should spend, assuming that she's ready to go the DSLR route instead of just a point and shoot, if she wants point and shoot, just go to DP Review and they'll tell you all of the different cameras and features and you can compare and buy. But, but I think, I don't know, what, what do you think, Patrick? I mean, you really probably put more choice, more time into your lens selection knowing that one lens is probably going to end up having three or four cameras behind it over the life of the lens, right? Yeah, it, but it's, it's funny. I, I, I bring up my iPhone and I shoot more pictures with my iPhone than I probably do with my work cameras. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, I have an iPhone and I have a GoPro and I have an old G9. Canon G9, mm -hmm. and then all my work stuff. And I never use the G9. I've used the GoPro maybe twice, and I use my iPhone every single day. Interesting. So it, it just goes to show that, just like you said, you always have it. It's easy. It's point and shoot. You don't have to think about it. I mean, I don't have the iPhone 4S, but, I mean, my girlfriend's 4S blows me away. We I actually just, uh, I have a dog blog for my dog. Shout out. The pickle <laughs> pot. <laughs> Um, and we somebody, an invite for the dog, but <laughs> somebody, somebody wanted a print of the dog, and I shot it with the iPhone, and I printed 11 by 14, and it looked stunning. So, I mean, it just goes to show you have nice light, a nice iPhone will work for you. Yeah, the, the best quality a camera can have, whether it's an iPhone or a point-and-shoot or whatever, is something that you feel comfortable having with you as much of the time as possible. Because if you don't have a camera with you, the fact that you own a camera is meaningless at that point. It just one that you'll carry with you. It just if 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 you've got your phone with you, you've got a camera. But if you want to get more serious about it, get a camera that that you're going to be willing to carry around. And again, I love that Fuji X100 that I hated at first when I borrowed from you. And now that's I went to Europe uh, earlier this summer. This is the only camera I took. Um, no extra flashes, no extra lenses, no nothing. And and I just sat there looking like condescendingly at tourists that would have like three heavy cameras around them and, and like the big zooms and then they got the back to hang on the side so they're standing like this. I'm just like, dude, yeah. <laughs> you're not enjoying this vacation anymore. You're, you're like, you're a pack mule. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you guys for that very thorough answer. I have another question that I'm going to kind of paraphrase um, from Ludwig. And he seems to have a bunch of blogs, some talking about technical aspects, some talking about general topic of photo blogging. How many blogs do you each own, and to what point does it make sense to create a new photo blog for something, and does it become cumbersome? Yikes. Do we have to disclose, disclose like, all <laughs> the blogs? <laughs> I've probably got a dozen right now. I, I probably have half a dozen. Yeah. So ideas that, that started germinating and didn't come to fruition or, or I mean, obviously Strobist and Hoko360 are my, my biggest two, but I've got a blog that mimics the layout of Strobist that is just like a, maybe a half dozen posts and they're all index posts, like by alphabetical and by subject. So I could create the index structure that I wanted for my blog. Um, I, I, and I, a dozen failed dumb ideas that seemed like a good idea at the time and a couple of park names just in case, you know, something happens. But but really, I think it makes sense to put the energy into one or maybe two. I mean, if you've got two different sides to your personality, maybe do a couple, but, but you really stand no chance of, of having a half dozen successful blogs unless you're named Nick Denton. I mean, he, yeah. he can do it, but mortals can't do it. Well, I think David said it to me once, and you can't do too many things well at the same time. So 
stick to something simple with one, but I mean, I have an iPhone photos blog. I, like I said, I have a blog for my dog. I have my work blog. I also have a blog like David where it's live, but no one knows about it, where I can try and change design and stuff like that, so I know that it's live. I have a few that I'm anonymous on. Um, it just it keeps going on and on, but to me, it's easy to track, but to someone who's starting, it might be a little mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. There's no opportunity cost to starting up a blog. That's the cool thing. Yeah. I mean, my... Well, I, I, I'm not even going to – I don't, I don't want to out him because he's technically, like, below age, I think, for blogger. But my kid will, will just, like, throw something up and try it and look at it. <laughs> and, you know, you, got, you can do it in five minutes, but it's this thing, and it exists. And you never know what it's going to grow into. I never expected Strobus to grow into anything big, ever. It was to get out of work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well – I think this still ties into a, another question that, or a question that another uh, reader had from Janine. Um, so maybe we can talk about it a little bit further. She says, David, I have two questions. Do you think it's possible to have a successful photo blog which covers a wide gamut of topics, i.e. reviews of photography gear, books, software, photography tutorials, etc.? Or do you think the key to success is having honing in on a specific topic, such as strobe lighting and related information? So let me let you answer that first question first. I, t I totally think you want to be as niche as possible. If you're starting a blog, the only, I think, real chance that you have, you have two chances. If it's spectacularly funny and viral and someone picks it up and it just goes, or if your subject matter is, is thin enough to where th that niche, it, you, you kind of own that niche and you can dominate that niche. Um, like you could start out a blog about cancer and you'd be like the five gazillionth blog about cancer, but you could start out a blog about a very, very, very narrow rare form of cancer, and you might be one of only two or three blogs about that, and and Google obviously would point people who are searching for that specifically, if that specific type of cancer to your site. So, so you definitely want to start as niche as possible. If you develop a lot of traffic and a lot of readership at that point, I think you can start to expand your niche, and that's certainly what I've done and what other people have done, but I think your best chance of getting traction is to stay, is to stay as, as laser focused as you can on the thing that you really want to write about and, and, and stick with it. And you're going to be a better writer because you're choosing something that you really care about too. Sounds good. Um, her, the second part of her question is, when and how did you start getting advertising sponsors from relevant and reputable merchants that your readers would view as adding value to your site and not as impositions? That is, that's a big deal. That last part is really a big deal. and, and, and um, so like, like most people, I started with AdSense, um, which is Google's, uh, you know, those little links you see to the side, paid, paid uh, content, whatever. Uh, and when someone would click on one of those ads, I would get a few pennies and Google would get a few pennies. Um, and then I, I kind of progressed into Amazon affiliates, which since I was talking about photo gear tended to make sense to me uh, at the time, and this was in 2006. So if you clicked on the little link that I said I shot this with an icon D1 or a D2 and it went to Amazon and you, you happened to, to buy that camera, then, you know, somewhere in Maryland I was doing a happy dance because I got like 4% of that as, as, as an affiliate link. Um, but then I literally had someone call me one time and say, how much would it cost for me to be like the only sole advertising on your blog? Like I, I want to be the only ever we want to point to our place and we don't want anyone else to be the adver advertisers. And I didn't know what to tell them. I mean, I was on the phone in a parking lot at a library between assignments. So I, I had to learn fast. And, and the best way I think to learn is to look at everyone else's advertise page, like advertise here and learn and see how they're doing it and, and create an advertising page that fits with who you are and who you want to get. And I've had that for the last five years, and that pre-qualifies anyone that would come to you and say, I would like to advertise on your site. Um, and obviously, you're going to have to have a decent amount of traffic for that to be viable. And to have a decent amount of traffic, you're going to have to be doing something that people come back to repeatedly and tell their friends about. So, so it's not a problem you need to worry about until you solve the big problem, which is, what do I want to write about that is, uh, that is interesting enough for someone to want to tell their friends about? And that is... That is the only thing that you have to do well to have a successful blog. If you can do that, you're set. If you can't do that, I don't know if there's any way that you can fix that. Okay. All right. So I think this is going to be our last question. Um, I've been refreshing to see if there's any new ones. But 
Someone wanted to know, ah uh, yes, Pat wanted to know, true or false? The reason why th that there are so many photo blogs and photo podcasts is that it's really, really hard to make a living from being a photographer. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Patrick? I'm still struggling. I'm eating ramen noodles for dinner today. <laughs> <laughs> but, which is what I was doing when I was your age, actually. So you're, it's a time-worn thing, right? Yeah. I think the question frames it like really simply, like like over overly simplistic. Um, it's always been tough to be a professional photographer, and unless you were like the very first professional photographer, like I don't know, somebody like Jane, uh, like like uh, like like uh, oh, who's the Civil War photographer? Uh, Brady? Uh, I can't, I can't remember his name. Now all of a sudden, I'm I'm, I'm old, but uh, or Daguerre, you know, he he probably had an easy time being a photographer, but everyone since them, it's been competitive. It's been tough. And I, I think seeing that it's tough to be a professional photographer and seeing a ton of photo blogs, they're kind of related and kind of not related. Uh, it's mostly that the Internet's exploded and, and people really are, have grown into this share everything kind of a mentality, which is just benefiting many professions greatly. And certainly photo is, is number, like, you know, one of the top ones on that list. You don't see accountants doing this so much. They're like, oh, I just came up with this new deduction. I'm going to tell everyone about it. But photographers, we've always liked sharing our ideas, like over the water, the water cooler, and the light box and such. So we're just doing it at scale now. Yeah, I would say. I mean, just because you see a lot doesn't make it mean it's it's hard. I mean, like anything, it's it's difficult to be any profession. And I think we just share more, and you see more. Um, and it was funny. I was just talking to a buddy about this, and it's and it almost stems back to to when you post and how much you post. It's weird because as photographers, we always post our best, and it makes us look like we're busy, and it makes us look like we're great, but we're still out there doing boring assignments and stuff that we we don't typically might like to do at the time, but it, it helps pays the bills. But right, it's almost like a self ego boost sometimes. Or you're you're curating what you're doing and presenting a curated version of yourself to the world, which if you think about it, is a nice way to put a little bit of a positive vicious cycle on the types of assignments that you're getting. If, if all you're doing is, is shooting, shooting pet photos and they're not like particularly well done or anything and, and you throw everything that you do out on your site, well, guess what you're going to get hired to do? More of that kind of stuff. But if you're selective, uh, I definitely think that you can use a blog to alter the type of assignments that you get and the type of things that you shoot. And, and certainly, Shrovis is my best marketing tool. I mean, I, I don't really market myself as a freelance uh, photographer that much because I can't put my contact information online because of the 500 email things. But I get all, almost all of my calls are like, hey, we're in Nebraska and we've got a company in, you know, in Laurel, Maryland, which is 15 miles from your house, and, 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 and I just happen to read your blog and, and are you interested in shooting this job? And so in that sense, Strobus definitely, definitely helps me as a, as a photographer. It is my primary marketing tool at this point. Yeah, and I'll, I'll rewind too. I mean, mine, same thing. I get lots of people want to license photos. Um, same thing, phone calls for assignments from new clients all the time. But it, it all stems from my blogger. I, I have other ways of, I have a website, I have an archive, but bloggers usually where they're coming to. Yeah, that actually relates to a question that um, somebody asks is, why do you still use blog or, or like blogging as a form of showcasing your art or your, your work? Um, have you considered like not stopping blogging, just doing it via social media, um, or do you think that blogging is still the way to go? I, I love Blogger. I mean, I, it, it's people ask me why I didn't choose WordPress or, or why why I'm not on 500 Picks or, or whatever. And here's the thing: I, Blogger is run by Google, has been since I was um, I started in 2006, or maybe even a little before. I'm pretty sure that Google's going to be around in five years. Uh, and there are all kinds of neat services that come along, and they're great, and they're spiffy, and they're very polished. But if you're going to be in this for the long term, you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to be comfortable marrying a company. And and I'm comfortable being married to Google because they're they're. And I'm not just saying you know saying this because Lisa's here, but they're 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 very robust. Um, my site doesn't crash. If something happens, like there's somebody in Mountain View that's like on it, you know, that, and stuff that's well beyond my technical capabilities. It's just like having, it's like buying a super reliable camera that you know is always going to work. I mean, why would you, why would you not do that? And why would you not blog if you're a photographer, too? 
it's just crazy. All, all, all of that search aggregates to who you are and what you're doing if you're writing about it all the time. It's, it's the best way to expand your footprint in real life that I can think of, and I don't even know what number two is. Patrick, did you have I, I, something? I just, I, I, he pretty much summed it up. I mean, I, I'm a little different. I do. Uh, I go to Twitter. I go to Facebook. I have the 500 pixels, but it's all a way, as David said, to expand my footprint. I want people beyond my normal editors to see my work, whether they work for a random company or they're no one that I'm, I'll ever meet in my life, or they're a young kid that's just trying to get into it. Um, I just want them all to come back to the one place, and that's why I always feed them back into the blogger. So, I mean, like, and like I said, I go back to it's my inspiration to, to put something online to, to make myself known and share my work and go back to, I can search to when well, I started in 2006 maybe. I can go all the way back and see what I was shooting then without having to dig through my folders on my computer. So that's, that's, your, that's your content. I mean, you have that. And you put something on Twitter, for instance. It's really neat, very easy, but it kind of goes away. It's got a half-life, and, and just it, it just flows into the stream. But, but things that you build on a blog are, they, they, um, it, it's, it's, like, it's sort of like feeding a 401K. It's just always getting bigger and more powerful and, and, and more ways for people to find you via search. So, it, in fact, it's, it's a lot like building a 401K in, 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 in that nothing's going to happen within the first couple of months, but you do it for a few years, and you look back and you think, oh, my gosh, look at all this. Look at the number of posts I have. Look at the way people have found me and such. It's, 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 it's the only way to do it as far as I'm concerned. Hey, Alan Christian. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Alan Christian is a developer and he's in our developer community, and he, he actually did the last Hangout on Air with us, teaching bloggers how to create uh, printer-friendly posts, and he's a photo blogger himself, so I invited him to join us. We actually just answered the question that you had asked about whether, um, <laughs> why um, they don't, uh, David doesn't use, what is it, the 500 pixels and stuff like that? Or, right. Why, why you host them on Blogger? Why do you host your images on Blogger versus um, like on Flickr or other types of services? Oh, gosh. Uh, w well, I do kind of use Flickr back and forth because in 2006 that was, that was like the site, um, and, and I've kind of just grown up there. Um, honestly, and, and th okay, so I, I told you like how cool and technical Google was for Blogger. Now I'm going to balance it by saying in 2006, Blogger did some weird compression where your pictures didn't look so great after they went through the picture mangling process, but that since changed, um, and that was one of my main reasons for using Flickr as a hosting solution so I could keep the tonal structure of my pictures the same. That's, that's different now. I mean, if you put a picture up on Picasso, it looks exactly the way when it comes out as when it goes in. So if I had to make that decision now, I would probably do it all within the vertical framework of Google because... It's, it's always been a little weird having one foot in the Google camp and one foot in the Yahoo slash Flickr camp. And it's a little, I think I'm a little bit more exposed as a result. Um, but, but that's what was there when I started. So it didn't really, uh, we've got a community of 100,000 people on Flickr, and you don't want to just walk away from that because that's a big funnel for people to discover your site. Okay, I can respect that. That's cool. Um, <laughs> Alan Christian, did you have any... Um, Questions, last minute questions. We're about to end, wrap this up soon. Or do you have any like particular insights from having been a photo blogger yourself? Uh, no, that was the only question. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, no, that was the only question. Um, I'm sure it was a great hangout. I just <laughs> saw it at the last minute. <laughs> Glad you could join us for the last few minutes. Nice to see your face down there. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you both so much for spending all this time answering my many, many questions. And I'm sh I hope that our users have found this um, useful. We'll, we'll be posting it as a YouTube video um, on our channel. And then, David, you're going to be hosting this on your blog as well. Yep. Oh, geez. <laughs> I thought I was just going to watch the whole time. <laughs> but, but you get dressed up. I know. <laughs> Oh, and Patrick, please be sure to comment on somewhere, you know, on our post, or maybe you can just send me your URL because we didn't get a chance to really show off your blog yet, so okay. we want to see that. Appreciate it. 
Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Adios.